Thanks, guys. Is this, everyone can hear me fine? Yep, good. Uh, so, uh, my name's Steven, uh, and let's talk about some JavaScript flow control with uh, set timeout, set immediate, and process next tick. And I'd like to point out, I started this talk with this amazing slide background. It's just like, it looks so professional, right? And my goal was do the whole thing like that. <clears throat> And that didn't happen. Uh, so a little bit about me. I'm from Node Orlando. Um, I have a kid. I live in SF now. I really like JavaScript um, because of it, that it's awful. Um, if you watch the WAT videos or anytime like you're, you know, d trying to debug Node, which is sometimes impossible, and you're like, I just, I, I hate this fucking thing. Uh, that's why I like it. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> uh, I moved here originally to work with uh, CJ. She abandoned me. Uh, Kit Cambridge also abandoned me. I love those guys. Uh, I, right now, I'm typing uh, computer things at Netflix, and, uh, and I'm very nervous. And later on, you can ask me why. Um, I gave this talk at uh, Baynode because uh, Ross K said, hey, anyone want to talk about process next tick? And I said, I have no idea what that is, but sure. Uh, and I gave the talk, and he said, I think if you polish that talk up, you would have a really great talk. So the plan was that I would do that and then present it here. And this is not the greatest talk in the world like we had originally planned. This is just a tribute. Uh, so let's get started. It's dangerous to flow control alone. Uh, like, let's take this set timeout concept. Let's don't take set timeout, you heathen dinosaurs. You don't use that for flow control in JavaScript the way that we have these like really powerful tools to do. So we're actually not really going to talk about that. We'll show why it's uh, bad a little bit later. Um, but let's talk about um, set immediate, like recursive deferral with set immediate. This is kind of a, a new thing that's come up recently in Node. Not super new, but um, if you guys all want to just take some time to read all of this, there may be a test later. Uh, I'm kidding. There's, there, the, the important part is the, while the order is preserved for execution of anything that you use set immediate for, other I.O. events may fire between any two scheduled immediate con uh, callbacks. And, I've got some code examples that we'll go over for that. But the important thing to remember is that set immediate, uh, you should use that if you want to queue the function behind whatever IO events uh, callbacks that are already in the event queue. Uh, so I've got this, uh, a couple of code examples here. By the way, I would like to take a second uh, to thank Node Botanist for loaning me a laptop. I had a huge fiasco uh, where I thought December 10th was Thursday all week. Uh, so I'm standing in line to, to go to Los Gatos to work, and then I'm realizing, like, oh, I have to be in Oakland today, not Los Gatos. So I was not prepared for this. Um, so stack overflows, if you've seen them, like we have a real simple function here. Um, it's just going to recurse a whole bunch of times. Uh, and then when it does throw, we've got this process uh, on, uncaught um, exception. That's a really good code practice, I'm told. Uh, and then this particular error throws what I like to call nearly perfect messaging. Uh, I think that's TM, so you might yell at me later, Isaac. We'll see. Um, so if we uh, fire this up in the console here, uh, it recurses a whole bunch of times, and then it just says, hey, range error, maximum call stack size exceeded. And you're like, great, that is actually nearly perfect messaging. I, I know exactly what to do with that, right? Um, and another thing that we can do here with the, uh, uh, let me get my bearings here real quick, continuous compute. So um, stack overflows are bad in general. I think I just heard uh, somebody from And Yet talking about how they were having problems with that. And I'm, I do apologize. I'm learning how to use this new computer. There we go. Is it going to go to Sublime? There we go. Uh, so let's say that we have this, this, this problem in our, in our application where we want to be able to respond to HTTP requests, but we also have to do some like long-lived compute function. Um, if we recursively call this compute function, like we're just going to get the same thing. We're just going to get a stack overflow, and it's going to block. We're not going to be able to respond to those HTTP functions. Um, so if you wanted to, you could do like a set timeout and just say, like, hey, every you know, 1,000 milliseconds, run this compute function. It's going to do something. And in the meantime, you can answer, um, you know, HTTP requests. And uh, do continuous compute here. You'll see over there, uh, we're running our server, and it's like kind of got this ongoing thing. And we're still able to respond to these requests. And that's like probably the worst and most inefficient way of doing that. So. I'm 
really struggling with the alt tabbing. Here we go. I term. I'll go back over here and kill this. And I feel like it goes back to Keynote when I really want Sublime. Uh, so if we use uh, process.nexttick like it used to work uh, a long time ago, it, it, is it doing that? That's not just like me and being jittery or... So we'll go back to Sublime <laughs> and then iTerm. There we go. And let's restart this continuous compute. And we don't, we don't even get anywhere. So it's like, oh, uh, hey, by the way, you're done. Like you use too many process next ticks and I just don't want to do this. But it gives you some nearly perfect messaging that says like you should be using set immediate in this version of Node because uh, we're not going to be using process next tick that way. And I'll show you an example of what we would use process next tick for later on. Um, the way that we actually want to do this, so we got this set immediate where the server is going to be allowed to work as much as it can, but we do want to allow it to respond to these requests. And you'll see over here, we're still able to ping the server, but obviously it's just like firing off a whole bunch of times uh, over there. So we're, we're no longer blocked by, by that process in the event loop. That's the general purpose for set immediate and, and process next tick. Now we'll go back to our slides here. And uh, we'll get into the actual differences here between process next tick um, using callbacks versus set immediate. So we're going to use process next tick to effectively queue the function at the head of the event queue so that it executes immediately after current function completes. Um, so in the tinkerings file here, there's a couple different examples that I've got. And right now we've got this, uh, these two different functions here. Uh, one is going to be maybe synchronous sometimes, uh, and one is going to definitely be synchronous all the time because we're going to use process next tick. Uh, and then a couple functions that we call in different orders. So um, right now, if I call uh, maybe sync and I pass in false and give it that callback, and then I call bar, does anyone know what the terminal output here is going to be? Okay. I thought that would be a good play on the whole doge JS thing, and then like the more I read it, I'm like loge, deloge. That doesn't even really, you know, like. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so we get this uh, deloge, and then loge is like, oh hey, I, I fired, and you're like, okay, uh, nice. So what happens if we change the arguments, and now our our statement basically changes the way that the function is going to run? They come out in a different order, and you're like, uh. Wait, so programmatically I want to change like some logic. I didn't want to change the order in which the program ran. Um, and that's why uh, you would use process next tick. So as you can see here in the, uh, the definitely sync, what we're doing is we're basically just saying, hey, like we, we want this to perform the same way every time. Um, so if we come down here and we pass in false, hey, look, it came out in the order that we might expect. And if we pass in true, it comes out in the same order. So it starts behaving a little bit more the way that our end users of this API would expect. Uh, and it's going to be consistent. Um, and that is actually where I get into, like, what is this? What is this sorcery? And there's, like, a, again, there's really long thing that you can read on Stack Overflow. Uh, when I first dug into this, there's, like, a whole lot of, like, older node stuff uh, and newer node stuff, and they kind of give misinformation. But um, this Stack Overflow post seemed to have a pretty decent amount of uh, good answers. Um, why should you use this? This actually comes from Isaac's blog post, um, which he points to another blog post. And he very adamantly says, like four or five times in one paragraph, go read the other post right now. You absolutely have to read that. I don't, do you still kind of stand by that? or? Yeah. <laughs> So you should probably go read both of these if you haven't. I'm going to assume that most of you have at this point. Uh, if you have an API that takes a callback, and sometimes it's called immediately, and other times it's called at some point in the future, 
then you render any code that's using this API impossible to reason about, and you cause the release of Zalgo. I actually don't really understand what that last line means, but I think it's bad. I think it's really bad. So, oh, and here's uh, <laughs> Node Botanist. See if I can not expose anything that I'm not supposed to hear. There's, um, so when I was digging into this uh, talk the first time at Baynode, I started to think like, well, this is like really, you know, loge and deloge. Yeah, perfect. It makes sense. That's a real world application, right? You guys do that all the time. And I was like, wait, nobody does that. Like, wh what's a, a an actual example of what we can do? You know. <coughs> To, to take advantage of these when we're constructing our, our modules so that people can use these and, and not have to worry about how it's going to perform later just based on, on the, the logic conditions, but they just know it's going to perform the same way every time. And this example is the one that I landed on. Um, so we have two constructor classes here, um, and they perform entirely different. And you've probably run into this, I would think, at some point, but the, uh, the synchronous one is really just a constructor. And we call that, we say, hey, we want a new sync. And it's going to say, hey, I'm going to parse some options for that. And then I'm going to initialize. And immediately after that, it does its initialize things. And it says, hey, I'm going to emit some events. And, and then I'm going to be done in this example. Uh, so if we run this block of code here that says, hey, you know, I want a new sync. And then I want to listen to the data event. And I want to listen to the end event. Uh, when we actually run. I need to block this out. There we go. We're getting back to the wonky behavior. Uh, so when we run that block of code, the, uh, the other logs that came out for what we thought would listen to those events never actually, never actually get there. And I've, I ran into this a few times, and I had no idea why. I was like, wait, I thought I attached an event emitter. And then sometimes it would work later on. I was like, OK, so it's, it works sometimes. I don't understand why. Um, but the async module that we wrote here uh, does one thing different. Instead of initializing uh, right away, it just says, hey, by the way, I'll, I'll finish up my initial at some point. Uh, you go ahead and finish everything else that you wanted to do. And then when you get back, you know, process.next tick, uh, I'll, I'll get my initializing done there. So we have the same block of code for our end users of this module, um, but they actually get to use immediately um, what they would want programmatically. So you can see right here, like it, it initializes the module, fires some initial events, and we capture those events later on in the code, and then you know, we can, we can actually use the module at this point. Has anyone ran into that when they're using like third-party stuff where you try to attach one, maybe two, <laughs> a, a couple? Uh, I, I did scratch my head for you know, like hours. Like I, I don't understand what's going on here. So, um, and since I'm doing the whole, like, I'm nervous and I'm going super fast and whirlwinding through, we're, like, we're almost done. Don't worry. Um, I did do some micro benchmarks. There's apparently some performance benefits that you can get here. Obviously, micro benchmarks are super important, and you can learn a lot about programming concepts if you only do micro benchmarks. <laughs> um, oh, let's see here. I'll just show you these, and then I'll show you the results. But essentially, um, what we do here is I just use a for loop and either use process.next tick or set immediate or set timeout to show you, you know, what the, the performance values were there. And it came out, again, like really super important micro benchmark information. Um, yeah, that's, that's useful, right? Uh, what I've heard, though, is that set immediate actually can be a little bit more performant when used properly. Um, I've had some coding challenges in the past where they just use that to like overload a whole bunch of stuff that you do, and you have to kind of like, you know, pause the stream and all of that. But you can you can really wind up the node process with uh, with set media if you use it effectively. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's all I got. Um, JavaScript flow control. It's uh, it's kind of complex. If you use these concepts, you use them right, and you read the right blog posts. I think you'll do all right. If you guys want, you can follow me at SPRJRX on Twitter. I say a lot of really stupid things, and they're not that funny, and I'm learning how to behave better. But, uh, uh, or you can check out my website, uh, stephenrevisjr.com. Thanks, guys. Woo!